Okay. Hello. I, I need to unmute yourself, Jake. I can't unmute you. Sorry. I am unmuted. <laughs> Yay! Okay. Uh, hi, everybody. Welcome to Learning Space. Uh, despite the fact that I put up the Weekly Space Hangout graphic at first, uh, Google has just changed the layout of Google+, Plus, which has completely uh, thrown me off my game here. So sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> we'll try and keep things rolling uh, like we usually do. Uh, uh, today, I am joined with Jake Nolstor. So, hello, Jake. <laughs> uh, my co-hosts Pamela Gay and Georgia Bracey are at the NSTA STEM Expo in St. Louis right now. So if you're a teacher in the Midwest and hopefully you're a science teacher in the Midwest and have been able to make it out to this conference, make sure to see the, um, the CosmoQuest booth there. Pam will be there most of the weekends. Uh, I am on my way to Virginia tomorrow for my own graduation ceremony. So uh, I'll, I'm, I'm missing that whole event, unfortunately. Um, uh, as usual, you can uh, comment, interact with us uh, on the uh, on the YouTube page, on the event page, uh, pretty much anywhere this is posted on Google+, we should be able to see that. Uh, I'm doing the best I can to keep up with all the different comment streams. Uh, and, oh, and if you're watching anywhere where it's embedded and you want to use Twitter, use the hashtag learning space. Uh, and you can get to us that way. So uh, please feel free to share the link and join in. Uh, before we get started with our main topic, I promised you guys I would um, take another stab at the film canister with dry ice because I tried this two weeks ago and uh, it did nothing. Um, I think it would work better with liquid nitrogen, but I don't have access to any of that at the moment. So as usual, you know, safety precautions when you're playing with dry ice. Um, this stuff is very, very cold and can burn your skin. Be very careful playing with this around little children. Make sure there's some distance. They don't reach out and grab it. Uh, I run into that a lot when I'm doing comet demos. Um, but I'm just going to stick a few chunks in the film canister here and let it sublimate. <laughs> You know, we should have brought dry ice to the bar for Yuri's night. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that, that would have made uh, extra fun times. <laughs> we had a little San Antonio meetup uh, at a bar for Yuri's night where we had um, drink specials on white Russians, thanks to Jake. It, so he set that all up for us. <laughs> all right, so I've got a whole bunch of dry ice in this film canister, and it's already sublimating, which means it's turning right from a solid to a gas, and the canister is very cold. And I'm just going to sit this here on the desk <laughs> next to the microphone. And uh, hopefully you... Oh! It already did it! <laughs> 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 Last week I didn't have enough in there and it sat there for an hour. It didn't actually launch though. We can do better. Um. <laughs> so what's happening is, uh, of course, the dry ice, the car frozen carbon dioxide sublimates and turns right into a gas. Um, I, I can't get these little pieces out. Ah, don't do that. Um, as it does, of course, there's a, a great pressure, pressure change as it turns directly into a gas. Um, so, I was hoping it'd be enough of a pressure change as the sublimates to actually pop the top off. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> I got it this time! So, that's, that's a way to safely demonstrate uh, something a little bit explosive using dry ice. Because uh, you're you're not gonna make too much damage with this film canister. <laughs> you know I'm just gonna do this through the whole show. I'm just, I'm just gonna do this through the whole show. There we go. Canister squirrel. <laughs> so yay, fun science demo. Um, <laughs> something you can do with dry eye safely uh, that doesn't cause too much of a mess. I'm seriously gonna do this through the entire show. I'm sorry, Jake, but. I'm a 12-year-old, so... It's okay. <laughs> you understand. I approve. You, I approve. <laughs> you approve and you understand. Oh, pop again. Okay, I'm going to stop now. Um, because you do a lot of family science. That's what we actually uh, wanted to talk about today. Um, so uh, why don't you first tell us a little bit who you are. I know who you are, but tell our audience who you are, <laughs> where you work, uh, the director of the, the Insight Lab, and uh, a little bit about what, what family science is. Yeah, so I'm the director of the Insight Lab at Rochester Institute of Technology, and I've been there for seven years now. The lab is seven years old, which I got there to start. Nice. Um, 
We work in a bunch of different areas. I know Nicole posted the link for the website somewhere <laughs> that some of you might be able to see. And we work in areas like family science. We develop a lot of science education technology. We do things to encourage people to work towards STEM research careers, even from as young as middle school. Okay. And we work on sort of learning experiences across the community and landscape as well that we call learning landscapes. Learning but today we get to talk about family science, so yes. <laughs> you can look at the other stuff if you want to. <laughs> <laughs> so what does that mean, uh, getting the whole of family involved? What kind of activities do you do? Yeah, so long ago before I came to RIT, I had been involved with various different fam family programs, that I'll call them in quotes, that pretty much all of the time seem to me to be really programs for kids that their parents have to drive them to. Mm -hmm. And then their parents would be sitting in the back of the room, drinking a cup of coffee, having a snack, chatting to each other, while the kids were around the table doing the hands-on science activity. Mm -hmm. And so me and some of my other colleagues at the time decided that we wanted to try and fix this problem and actually have the parents doing something, have the parents believe that they could really help their children in science learning because sometimes as their kids were getting into middle and high school, the parents wouldn't think that they could really in interact and engage with their kids about science because they were scared about the science too. Okay. So trying to provide the parents with the support to do that, but also show them that they could be engaged in science learning with their kids. And so have sequences of programs where we would have activities where the whole family is really having to work together and then from that, slowly developing that neat desire for the parents to really be involved and participating. So some of the things we look for, for example, right near the first session, you'll see parents whispering in their kids' ears the answers when you ask questions. But three or four sessions later, if they've been attending, the parents stop doing that and tell their kids to shut up and they're raising their hands because they want to call out the answer. And so <laughs> that's kind of what we're going for, to get the parents sort of back engaged in that STEM learning. So then as a family, they engage more in activities or at least start describing more things as being family activities. So when we look at the evaluation from the program, yeah. that one of the things we see a lot is not necessarily that the families actually did start doing more science activities, but when we ask them what science activities did you do in the last month, they get much better at writing down what they count as a science activity. So they're much more flexible about that and much so more creative probably destroyed several kitchens over the course of these programs. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> I like cooking and science, so there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> so um, do the parents and then the families of SARF, do they have a background in science already, or are they coming to it completely new, like, like their kids are? A lot of them are coming to it completely new. Obviously, we do these programs on places like we've had some on NASA bases, we've had some on college campuses, so mm -hmm. that attracts a little bit of that science parent, but a lot of the time we do get a good mix in. We have a lot of homeschool parents who bring their kids as well because they form a big group of worried worried parents about how they're delivering that to their kids. Sure, yeah. When they might not be expert in science, it's one of the first areas they start struggling with with their kids when they're homeschooling. But then we've had every other combination of families show up too. It's still hard to reach some communities and there's some mm -hmm. I think all the families that you get are sort of, we'll call them nerdy, science participating nerdy families. So, you know, they're, they're all the kind of families that you do see around Science Center, the museums, and okay. going to those sort of events and attending star parties and things. So you're not, it's not often breaking into an entirely different sets of families. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it does, but mostly there are other sciencey ones but still it's good to have the parents and kids really believe that they can do that together. Because a lot of the time the parents are just taking them to the event at the museum because it's a good thing to go see, but they're not really engaged themselves as part of the, as part of the learning experience because it's like for their kids. Yeah, yeah, so, and I think most, most activities that I've done seem to be built that way. It's built for the kids and the parents show up and they're very supportive, um, but rarely do you get them. The, the only time I've really seen parents jump in is with uh, the infrared camera. Yeah. <laughs> they get really curious about, you know, so if you have access to one of those, that gets people interested no matter what. But yeah, for the most part, it's like, oh, they're giving the experience to their kids. 
um, but not necessarily do yeah. it themselves. Um, how, how... It's because some of this time, it's because they might feel also kind of embarrassed in front of their kids, I guess, of yeah. not knowing, not really knowing the science content. And it, there's, we you know topics in astronomy that nobody really knows, like phases of moon and seasons. So most parents you have in a room don't know the right answer because most of the population doesn't know the right answer. Right. And so when you're doing an activity that is trying to teach that, you can sometimes get into a struggle because you're trying to teach them this science topic that the parents think that they should already know and so don't want to admit to their kid that they really had the answer wrong all along. Oh, okay. So we kind of look at that a bit and we try to do activities that don't try to teach that science content type thing in that way. So we, we try to leave that for the education system mm -hmm. to deal with and then just encourage them in other sort of inquiry-based learning that isn't really connected. What we really, really care about is that the family is learning together and doing something together that no one knows the answer to. Okay. And that there isn't this specific correct answer a lot of time. You don't have to but answer they, to standards. <laughs> you don't have to answer no. to educational standards no. with parents. <laughs> So that they can be building and experimenting with things. I can see the sunlight moving into my face. <laughs> <laughs> and so there's a lot of sort of building, experimenting activities, other things we like to do. There's a good activity where you get iron out of breakfast cereal and you can try different kinds of cereal and get different iron out of it because if it's fortified with iron, yeah. it normally means that they just sprayed on iron after they made it, like actual iron. <laughs> so that doesn't make me feel good. too good. Because I'm iron parent. deficient, you know, and I feel like if it's not being digested, if it, they're just yeah, no. on. yeah, oh, wow. But, so that's a good experiment, and that people don't really know the answer to or how to get to the answer. So it gives them that good inquiry. You can do things like melting ice cubes on different colored pieces of paper. That's a good one too. It doesn't work out in any predictable manner at all. Oh really? Okay. <laughs> for unknown reasons. Wait, like construction paper? Now I want to do this. Yeah. What, what is this? And you would think. So if you set up like a row of construction paper and put yeah. ice cubes on it of different color construction paper, you can come up with a hypothesis about which color you think is going to melt fastest or slowest. But if oh. you've included black and white in there, then probably in your hypothesis you've got black at one end and white at the other end, and it doesn't work out that way. Oh, really? Okay. I'm going to try this now. And you can do other things that too, like if you put little plastic yeah. cups over the top. So people think it'll melt faster because it's inside a greenhouse, but actually the ice can keep the air inside the cup okay. cool, so it insulates itself pretty quickly. And so those melt slower. So there's a lot of sort of things that the parents don't feel bad about not knowing because it's not like this was an expectation that yeah. you should know which color construction paper melts ice fastest, <laughs> but still let you do that inquiry-based activity to, I don't know what you're understanding, but at least interact. <laughs> Yeah, well, science, you're thinking doing about your scientific yeah. inquiry with your kids, and learning you're thinking how about the colors and yeah, how that learning might learning about how you had a hypothesis, how it was wrong, and why then, how then you deal with that being wrong because yeah. thinking about those. Can we issues. make politicians do this too? <laughs> <laughs> just, I'm if just going to show up in Congress <laughs> with a bunch of construction paper and ice cubes and be like, "We're going to town." <laughs> Oh, so what kind of um, science activities do you find them doing with their families um, after after the programs? All kinds of crazy, insane things. My favorite was this one picture of the inside of one family's freezer in their house, full of all of these plastic cups of different concentrations of mud and water, investigating which would freeze fastest or slowest over time. It had nothing to do with any of the science activities, we'd been, this was a part of family that was coming to a family astronomy program that we were running. So it had nothing to do with family astronomy, but they wanted to share it because they're like, it's totally like, the mom was like, five months ago, I would have absolutely said no. I would have refused to yeah, let my kids <laughs> fill my freezer with different cups of mud. But after being in this program, I realized, why was I saying no? And I can just, okay, fine, let's test. Why do, what do you think is going to happen first? <laughs> then we can do it. So I'm like, that's just what we want you to do. <laughs> that's fantastic. That's really cool. Um, do you have, what kind of activities do you do in the programs? How, like, what are they like? How long do they go for? So uh, we've done a bunch of different things. So, most recent one that we've run with Rochester Museum and Science Center was a little bit different and more complicated because they, 
the families involved in that program are actually responsible for creating family days, including exhibits at the museum. Okay. So those families were creating family science experiences for the public to come to. So in their sessions, we had a lot of time with them trying to develop that while sort of understanding and learning the science and how to interact and how to get everyone involved at the same time. So that was a bit different sort of program. Um, that's pre museum creation. I don't know what that's actually called, but yeah. <laughs> They're creating yeah. the exhibit, right. And so our previous sort of standard model of family programs has been to have a two hour long program that has always been on a weeknight. We, st we did tried some on weekends, but when we want families to come consistently over time, we found that a school night is better, even though the kids might be a bit tireder, but the parents don't plan anything else on top of it. Right, Whereas right. weekends get very haphazard very quickly. So it, we normally do weeknight for a two hour long program. And we'll start off with about the first 15 minutes they'll have an arrival activity that they can work on as a family and can either spend five minutes on or 15 minutes on. So the, while we're waiting for families to come late, because they're very badly behaved about arriving. So <laughs> you have, you well, have, you to, have, kids. You you have to program band. in that time, otherwise you find yourself just starting over and over and over and over and over again. Then in that model, we actually split the kids and the parents up. Go have a session with the parents where, where we do basically like you would do teacher professional development with, with okay. them. And so we're talking to them about how, how to ask questions, how to find teachable moments, how to look out for your kids learning, doing all that kind of thing. So like you would do inquiry-based science training, but for the parents. Mm -hmm. And meanwhile, we have the kids working with brand new data or information so that there is absolutely no way that their parents can have seen it before. Okay. Apart from one, we had an ar uh, astronomer from the University of Arizona in one of our programs one time who was working on one of the missions we used data from, so he cheated, but <laughs> most of the time... Had he actually kid, shown his kids the data? No, but he knew about it. So <laughs> okay. The, the oh, point of the, I see. So the kids are learning about this data that their parents can't know about oh. or have seen about. So when their parents come back, the kids have to explain yeah. it to them and actually learn that their parents actually really don't know what they're talking about. Oh, <laughs> because yeah, their first expectation when the parents come back is that the kids think that the parents are just asking them questions for the sake of the questions. Yeah. But then they actually find out that their parents have, it's like, no, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> you're the expert, so now explain it to me. And so that helps with that back and forth communication too and not feeling uncomfortable about it because it's something you didn't know, it's fine. And this is how you figure it out. And then, so that will then lead into a longer inquiry activity they do as a family probably for the last 45 minutes of the session so that they'll spend that time on some kind of inquiry project where they have to create a hypothesis and then test it in some way. And we've done all kinds of different things from that across the spectrum of activities. But again, so they're actually doing some experimental hands-on stuff and not just trying to, certainly not like finding out what little G is or something that has the right answer. So, so sticking to things that have crazy answers. Yeah, yeah. And thinking of like the carbon dioxide example, we do do one activity that has co comet making in it and we do one that it's basically the same, but they make like Mars surface in a little pan. And oh, so yeah. they can like make different, they look at the maps of different percent compositions across Mars's surface and choose different places to like simulate their Mars surface with water and dry ice, and oh. dirt, oh, that's iron cool. oxide. <laughs> so where but, do you get and in, But in the activities with that, for the, with the dry ice, is a great way of also keeping the parents involved because we make them work in a family group on it. And we put the parents responsible for their kids' safety and well-being. <laughs> so it sort of very helpful. It sort of keeps them on. They have to not be sitting at the back of the room drinking coffee, else their kid will die. Well, so well, like, okay, but do you give? The, <laughs> I've had issues with adults and dry ice occasionally. Yeah, we give the parents give them the instruction. safety lecture first. Okay. Yeah, that's another thing we do in that parent session. Is like, not naming doing, any names. <laughs> when we're do, when we're doing our activity, we are 
are going to be giving you dry eyes. This is how you handle it safely. This is how your kids should not be doing things with it. Right, right, right. Yeah. And so we don't, we don't expect them to be qualified in handling dry eyes, but we will train them in that. And then it's up to them to keep their kid alive. <laughs> well, you know, you can find it in the grocery store. It's not like it's, yeah. a, <laughs> it's a hidden substance. But I think you have to be 18 to buy it. Yeah, usually you have to be 18. I'd, I'd, most yeah. states. All right. Oh, where do you get your activities from? Like, where, what ideas? Where do you get the ideas for these hands-on activities? Do you just pull from resources around the web? Yeah. Yeah. You just, have this <laughs> you just Google. Group of students who <laughs> come up with insane activities. That helps. <laughs> Me come up with insane activities. <laughs> do, do, they do just you have, have to be things? brave and trust that it's just going to work. <laughs> oh my god. I mean, I came yeah. up with the activity of melting ice cubes on pieces of paper. That was actually for. Like end of year science class at this middle school that I was working at when whatever we were supposed to be doing was completely not doing what it was supposed to be doing at all. And then we managed to keep every class period for an entire day totally occupied by just melting ice cubes. I should so. introduce you to my friends in Virginia who do a middle school after school program. And yeah, they have similar issues where it's like, yeah, all right, we got to come up with something right now. Do it. <laughs> do you I have think that's a as long as you're doing that kind of increasing where there's not a right answer, yeah, then you're pretty safe in being able to just keep inquiring and making new hypotheses and trying out other things. And you can, as long as you just keep asking questions all the time yes. and never tell anyone the answer to the question, you can, you can <laughs> make an activity out of anything. <laughs> That's brilliant. I love it. I love it. <laughs> Monitor and adjust is their motto. Yeah. So that, that totally makes sense. Do you have you collected all these? Crazy, insane activities. A lot of them are activities. If you go on the family web page down at the mm -hmm. bottom, I think under projects, right at the bottom, oh, you I can go it. to the Motorola one. That has a bunch of the activities up there. Okay. The NASA Family Science Night ones are all available. If you click that link with me at the top of that page okay. to get to their website, you have to send an email to get registered for that website, but then all of the activities are free. And oh. soon that might be released publicly because that project is now at its end. And then the other ones that we've been working on with the museum group, they're in process of being prepared. So if you keep checking back on that, join our family listserv, like us on our Facebook page, then you'll find out when you can get more of those activities. Awesome. So this is, I'm going to post, um, it's the, the insight.rit.edu is the website. And then when you go to, yeah. at the top, it says family science. So if you're yeah. watching this, you want to play along. If not, I will, of course, include the links in the show notes. Uh, afterwards. Um, so that's cool because I'm always looking for, I just spent half an hour this afternoon vacuuming cocoa powder out of my suitcase <laughs> from all the comet, de uh, not comet, crater demos I've done um, over the last month and, and I realized I could not, I'm borrowing Pamela's robe for graduation and I didn't want to put it in my suitcase with cocoa powder. So long start. Yeah, I'm trying to. I'm trying to find more activities, more different activities. So that is that is really yeah. a great resource. Cool, cool. Um, so do you know of other? So you guys do this in Rochester. Mm -hmm. Um, are there other? Is there like a national network of people who are working on such stuff? There's sort of a small network that is out of the NASA Family Science Night. Okay. So that has a a bunch of people in a bunch of different settings that have been working on that. And there is a forum facility on there, but people don't use it very much. Okay. So, but if, if <laughs> On our list, our list server, we're going to try to start sending out weekly or bi-weekly newsletters for that so that you get regular updates on our ideas about what to do. Okay. And then on, if you're creating, if you've got a group of families that are working with you, that if you go to that Family Science Forums website that's linked off our page, that has the facility to allow you, if, if you are hosting a family program, we could create for you a space in that where all of your families can interact together and also share stuff with other groups of families that are working in different family science experiences. So that's supposed to be a sort of collection of sub forums based on mm -hmm. each family group that's working on something. And that's going to be available to the public from this summer too. Awesome. Up to now, it's just been for the NASA project we did with Rochester Museum and Science Center, but now we're opening that up at the end of that project so that it's going to be there for anyone to have that space if you want. That's really cool. So if you're looking to start a similar family science program, definitely join this listserv, join this group. Um, what about for families looking for such programs? Do you have any advice? 
on stuff, how to find stuff no. in your area? <laughs> no. The, it's very hard to find things that are located places. I mean, mm -hmm. using Google, <laughs> typing in family science program, gotcha, gotcha. name off place where you're looking for family science program, sometimes gets you a result. I mean, we know that's the difficulty and there's not, yeah. the, there are sort of after school organizations, but mm -hmm. the collection is so eclectic that it's hard to really have a good place that you can always say, oh yeah, go there and it's, right, they'll right. let you know what it is because you have schools that run after school programs, you have museums and science centers, you have universities and colleges, you have all kinds of different groups that do it. So it's hard to find a common thing that even all of these people call themselves. Yes. Yeah, yeah, we're having a similar thing with STEM Center here. I mean, it's mm -hmm. just like, that means a whole lot of different things. Um, one place, I mean, I think if you're looking for stuff locally, I'm thinking about this now as I'm thinking about advertising programs locally, I, you know, community forums, local newspapers. I know some towns have, like, what's up this weekend yeah. sections in their newspaper. I guess I would... I would like, local that. parent magazines are really good. Yes. If you have those, a lot of, like... Our university have a huge family list sort of from their K-12 office to, I don't know why, but they do. <laughs> so that gets to a lot of people. Okay, the homeschool yeah. parents are like ninjas on that kind of thing. So <laughs> yes. they're all very, they communicate a lot with each other at the network. So you can get a very fast out to that. And then even we've tried going through schools to talk to families too, but that can be more tricky because right. the families then think it's a school thing. And if it's not actually at the school as a school thing, it's hard to keep those families engaged. Gotcha. Do you have any difficulty getting getting parents engaged in the beginning? Uh, do they come into it knowing they're going to participate, or do they think, I'm going to just drop them off? And... We tell them, but they don't really believe us. But <laughs> by the end of the first session, they do really believe us. So okay. you, you definitely have to train and educate them mm -hmm. in the way that you want them to be. And we, yeah. When we're training facilitators, we'll teach them, tell them things like, you know, make sure that when you're asking questions, you're asking the parents questions as well as asking the kids questions. And if you see parents whispering the answers to their kids, call on the parent to tell you what the answer is and like be mean to them and don't let them get away with it because they, they're just not used to it. So they're not trying to be bad, but you have to show what you wanted to have happen. They have to be the student again. That's hard. Yeah. That's really hard to do. And yet, yeah, and beforehand you do have to make sure they know that they're going to have to sit there because sometimes they're definitely, we're I'm just expecting to house. drop their kid off. <laughs> and it's like, no, you have to stay and do this. It's not like going to soccer practice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We have a comment from, uh, from Guido Vibra saying, you have no idea how, mu how much such a program is needed here in Germany. Do you have any advice <laughs> for our German friends? <laughs> Email us and we can help you figure it out. <laughs> there you go. Okay. <laughs> Join the listserv and email. Yeah. Email Jake. <laughs> tweet Jake. He's got his Twitter name on his, his lower yeah. third, too, so you can tweet at him. I think yeah. you use Twitter occasionally. Yeah. Sometimes I see you on If there. people tweet me, I tweet back. <laughs> okay. Okay. No one's tweeting at me. I just get bored. <laughs> Everybody tweet Jake <laughs> so he doesn't get bored. <laughs> oh, man. Um... I know you uh, talked a little bit about family science at the National Science Teachers Association conference we were at in San Antonio. Um, mm -hmm. Was there any uh, interesting feedback you got from that discussion from people who do programs all over the all over the country? I think pretty much along the same kind of things we've been talking about. Everyone falls into I a can't few categories so. <laughs> of like when when you schedule it, how do you recruit families and if you want yeah. to do longer term families how do you keep families coming back mm -hmm. and how bothered are you that they do I mean the, if you look at the NASA family science night stuff it has nine modules so it's supposed to be once a month through the school year okay and getting a family to do nine months worth some families do but it's pretty rare compared yeah. to ones who will do three months in one school term and then not come back or do occasional ones here and there so you have to really decide on what principle you're happy with of what level of commitment you want to get from the families. Right, right. Mostly it's just that we want them to tell us if they're not coming back another time so we can give that spot to another person. Sure. sure and that's sure. been the bigger problem. But 
I think that's okay. Recruitment, you just have to figure out what, because that's so localized and different yeah. and depends what else is going on there, but hasn't posed too much of a problem for us ever. And then making it that genuine family learning experience. I mean, we had some very negative evaluations for the family science night when it was run at a school for extra credit near the end of the school year where oh, okay. kids, the primary group participating was kids who needed to get the extra credit to pass their science class. And those parents did absolutely not want to be there because it was like they're being, their kids in trouble and they're being punished. punished. Yeah. Oh no. <laughs> it's like we didn't choose to come to this to do yeah. family science It's because my kid was failing science class so we had to come. So. so that was something you tried and it didn't work as well. That didn't so. work. <laughs> So they do that. <laughs> what about the overachieving students? Do they want extra credit too? Do yeah. They so you get some of those, but and they they drag their parents too. But those parents are normally more supportive anyway. But okay. Sometimes. <laughs> Having been one of those obnoxious kids, it's it's okay, kids. You can you can do that. Yeah. <laughs> oh boy. Um, I'm trying to think. Um, I'm particularly interested in. So, how have you? Thought of ways to start reach parents that aren't necessarily the sciencey geeky types. You know, is there a way of expanding beyond that that population that you found works or have thought of, <laughs> or that we can we, think of right now? <laughs> that we found work. No. <laughs> okay. Okay. So you've tried some it's things. It's very. It's very very difficult. Okay. The first issue is an issue of reserving space for them in the program because mm -hmm. if you want those families to be there you kind of have to ban the overachieving families from signing up somehow okay but then it's hard to sort of punish families for being too in it's like you're too interested in science you can't come to our program that sort of <laughs> Yeah, right. And and it takes it takes a lot more more human power to run multiple programs in yeah. one week to get to more people yeah and it's yeah. Yeah, and there's not really a good test mm -hmm. of if if you sign up for our program, I can't tell if you're like what category of family you are. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. Can you tell from the evaluations or do you tell through the interactions with We do from yeah, mostly well yeah, both of those. <laughs> okay. I guess a lot from the interaction, but then also the evaluations when we ask them what other science things have you ever done? Have you ever visited a science museum? Okay. Have you? Do you own like a telescope or a chemistry set or any of that kind of stuff? So we ask them that up front, so we have some idea. But mostly they're families that do have some stuff like that. Right. And then we tried in this the one we were doing with the science center to recruit through schools in areas that we know were not participating families mm -hmm. demographically. And that was just a disaster because once we recruited the kids through the school, basically, they had no way of making their parents get there. Right. And so a bunch of them ended up coming with one of their teachers and we sort of stopped it being a family program because it was just sort of an after school club that they were doing there. Right, right. So, which we're not saying was a bad thing, but it, was, it wasn't a family program. Right. In some cases, you have we, both parents working, working yeah. weird hours, and then you just, yeah. When you have both parents working weird hours with limited transport and yeah. all of those kind of things, even though we provided them a bus back and forth to the school, that didn't help parents who didn't live that close to the school or couldn't get to the school on time. Or, so there was just many, many issues in that. Mm -hmm. And so we didn't have a solution. Okay. And we know that they're just really, that they are really hard to get to. And we know it's a problem, and we don't know how to solve it. We tried um, community centers. Yeah, was yeah. quite a good. That's a good way of getting the kids in the program too, because the kids are there in the program. But again, it could be really difficult to get parents and the kids at the same time, because a lot of the time the kids will be there right after school because the parents aren't out of work yet. Right. And so parents come to things later in the evening, maybe, but then the kids have already been there for five hours and you don't want to be dealing with them. <laughs> <laughs> Please take yeah. them away. Yeah, they yeah. need a change of scenery. So. Having, having done after-school programs, I understand that. Like, Please take your children. Yeah. They're too full of energy for me. We're done. <laughs> 
they're wonderful, but we're done. Yeah. Um, so for the parents and, and the families that you do get coming, do you get a sense of whether it's the kids driving the nerdy, geeky science-ness? I don't know how to call it. Or is it the parents, or do you find a mix of both? We look at that on the evaluations, and it is totally a mix, especially after there have been a few times. They've totally broken down, and the parents are being as nerdy as the kids are. <laughs> so, yeah, after the first couple of sessions, it completely works out that they're on board, on top of things. Because mm -hmm. I could see, the kids. thinking back to my own childhood, and my mom was not a scientist at all, but recognized my interest in science. And so she would have gone to such a thing with me, you know, and been very skeptical and been like, what the hell are we doing, <laughs> you know, at the beginning. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I wonder how many come in because the kids say, I want to do this, and how many of the parents are like, I want to do yeah. this. That's, I think that's probably a 50-50 split that we see. Okay. You have the parents who think it would be good for their kids. Right. <laughs> and then you have the kids that want to participate and do it. So I think that's a probably a 50-50 balance. Gotcha. And the, yeah. the parents know their kids, and so when they hear about the program, know their kid will be into it, ask the kid, the kid's like, yes, let's do it. And then right. that's right. how you've got them hooked. But The parents getting... have it easy these days. My mother didn't have Google. I don't know how she put up with me. Thank you, Mom. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> At least you have Google and these programs, these family science programs. Um, what's been your Favorite? Do you have a favorite moment from doing these programs? Something particularly silly <laughs> that happened? Some particularly silly moment. <laughs> you have children in science. Something silly has to happen. Something silly always happens. I think watching engineering dads fighting over resources to build their <laughs> egg drop spaceship lander to get them to the surface of Mars. Yeah, I could see that. <laughs> And considering yes. their engineering PhDs, <laughs> basically at one point in the session having to be told that they did have to actually let their children join in too. <laughs> that's fair. That's fair. That's funny. Oh, that's funny. Oh, so uh, I want to remind you guys if you have any other questions and comments. We also had a hello from Nicaragua from Julio. So Julio, so hello, Nicaragua. Hi. We've got people watching all over. <laughs> Um, so yeah, use the YouTube, use the Google events, use the Twitter, hashtag learning space, and those should get to us. I'm, uh, trying to keep track on the pages as well as I've been having some issues with Comment Tracker, but, uh, you should be able to, to get us, uh, through there. Um, but if you want to wrap up, Jake, do you have any, um, last minute plug for the family science programs and listserv or any, um, last messages about, about the program? Yeah, sign up for the list to be brave. <laughs> be brave! <laughs> and we're happy to like share anything that I've been talking about, any resources, or if you want to brainstorm ideas, that's fine too. Just drop us a line and we'll definitely see what we've got that we can help you out with when you're trying to start setting things up. Very cool. Yeah, Jake does a whole lot of things, so I'm sure we'll have you back um, because we work on all the things. <laughs> <laughs> all the things. I'm just, yeah, I want to talk about the Microsoft Connect things that you guys did at NSTA, because mm -hmm. that was really cool. So we'll have, to, we'll have to have you back to talk about something like that. Um, so thank you for joining us, Jake. Um, You're welcome. For watching me make dry ice do funny things. Look, it's freezing the air around it now on the thing. Um, we have, what's today? Wednesday? Tomorrow is usually the Planetary Society Hangout, but I haven't uh, caught up on, on what they're actually talking about tomorrow. So, But look for that on their page on Google+. Plus. Um, Friday is the weekly space hangout, which is the show that I had the graphic for at the beginning of the show. Just ignore that. Um, but the weekly space hangouts are your space news wrap up at uh, noon Pacific. Razor Kane's at Google I.O., so he won't be around. I'm going to try and call in from Virginia. I think Pamela Gay will be running the show, so we will still have a show for you. Uh, and then Sunday night's a virtual star party. I know they're doing an astrophotography contest right now, so be sure to submit your astro photos to the virtual star party, um, and they will feature it in their episode on Sunday night. Um, so thank you, everyone, for watching. Thank you, Jake, for joining us, and we'll You're see you welcome. next week. <laughs>